Hello, welcome to our overview of some of the major stylistic movements of the 20th century. We will look at three movements that characterized artistic approaches and dominant themes of the years leading up to World War I, the years between World War I and World War II, and the years after World War II. Although the work of these artists and movements are not necessarily overtly political, they are responding to the changing social dynamics and collective tensions that accompanied the drastic and in many instances traumatic geopolitical developments occurring in the first half of the 20th century. And although these movements are all quite different in their design elements and techniques, they do all reflect a desire to speak directly to the human condition of the new century, which as a result of technological advances and the breakdown of traditional culture and social norms, looked nothing like any other time before it. We see a map here of the borders in Europe after World War I, when some of the giant empires were dismantled and independent nations arose to better reflect the ethnic and cultural identities on the continent. The alliance system was replaced with an attempt at popular sovereignty and international cooperation in the West, while countries like Great Britain still held fast to many colonial territories around the world. Before the First World War, a growing sense of nationalism reinforced the divisions among the larger countries, but it also exacerbated the tensions within nations where multiple ethnic groups and cultural communities were suppressed in favor of the dominating culture and language of the state. Artists were not immune to these instances of national pride nor were they immune to the growing cultural tensions within the Western world. As a result, art in Europe took on the role of communicating the conflicted experience of living in such tense circumstances. Similarly, artists used their work to communicate the confusion and disorientation that followed both World War I and World War II, when logic and sense could not explain the horrors and tragedies that had taken place. As we shall see, both naturalism and abstraction offered artists opportunities to express the troubled world they lived in, while also experimenting with new possibilities for art to question and reevaluate the status quo. One of the reasons why both World War I, which took place from 1914 to 1918, and World War II, which took place from the late 1930s through 1945, were so devastating on the populations of Europe, the Americas, and the rest of the world, was the degree to which technological advancements had increased the brutality of warfare. New machines like tanks, cannons, machine guns, and bombs on aircraft wrought havoc on whole stretches of land and entire populations of towns and cities. Not all technological advancements were dangerous though, as inventions like radio, television, and the automobile, and the proliferation of the assembly line in manufacturing, which created new jobs in areas of study while connecting people across the globe. In science and social science, new discoveries about the natural world and theories about human behavior helped explain some of life's remaining mysteries. And changing social dynamics allowed minorities, women, and overlooked communities to assert more presence and power in the worlds of industry and politics. So much of these changes affected the role of artists and art from the 1910s to the 1950s. No longer was the artist considered a craftsman, as in the medieval period, a genius, an intellectual, as in the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, or a lonely and impulsive individual, as in Romanticism. Instead, the 20th century artists were mouthpieces for the times and places where they lived, using both traditional and innovative design elements, new media and techniques, and subject matter derived from both internal experiences and external events to create works that spoke to a distinctly modern audience. 
we will look at some representative examples from three movements that shaped understandings of modern art in the 20th century, cubism, surrealism, and abstract expressionism. <clears throat> cubism was coined by the French art critic Louis Roussel and when describing the little cubes he saw in the paintings of Georges Braque. Along with the Spanish artist Pablo Picasso, Georges Braque helped pioneer a new artistic style that emphasized the fracturing of the image into fragments and geometric shapes, disrupting the traditional role of perspective and line in the composition of a figurative work. In the early years of Cubism, from around 1908 to 1911, both Picasso and Braque worked tirelessly at their experiments with line and perspective, offering multiple angles of an object or person simultaneously in ways that were both real but impossible in actuality. A precursor to Cubism, Picasso's painting Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, or The Ladies of Avignon, depicts a scene of five female prostitutes within a brothel. This is a completely new take on the female nude. Rather than making these women appear to be voluptuous, curvy goddesses, these women are angular, with no subtle shading or modeling to make their naked bodies seem naturalistic. In fact, the two women on the right side of the canvas display African masks, referencing Picasso's interest in the art styles of the French colonies where form and function were more intertwined and abstraction could still communicate aspects of the human form. We also have multiple perspectives happening simultaneously, as the two women in the center are meant to be lying on beds, as if we were hovering over them and the figure at the far left draws back a curtain, not to enter an illusionistic space, but rather to enter a scene where the ground is constantly shifting. The lack of linear and atmospheric perspective does not make this scene any less true, for all of these perspectives do in fact exist in reality. What Picasso has done with extraction, however, is to fragment the scene so the viewer can take in several vantage points at once flattening the scene and reminding viewers of the two-dimensional surface upon which the women exist. Something similar happens with Brock's landscape painting shortly after, called Houses at Lestock. Again, there is no determined interest in depicting linear or atmospheric perspective with the goal of creating illusionistic space. Instead, everything is formed from lines, angles, and shapes with more stark contrast between light and dark areas in place of careful chiaroscuro modeling. The colors here are much more muted, staying confined to earth tones that may better recall the landscape before him, rather than bright tints or pastels that bring attention to the effects of light, as the Impressionists had done in their outdoor scenes. Brock and Picasso restrict their color palette even further as they progress in what is known as analytic cubism, when the two artists created paintings that were difficult to correctly attribute and distinguish between the two men. Brock's painting here is a portrait, but certainly not in a traditional sense. The figure of the Portuguese is seated in front of us but we have to work hard to make out the shapes, lines, and contours of his physical features. They have been shattered as if this were a reflection in broken glass, allowing the viewer to see multiple angles and perspectives simultaneously, as we did in Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. Brock even includes stenciled letters and numbers in the scene, recalling his time as a house painter and stenciler for decorative wallpaper motifs which undoubtedly emphasized the flatness of the painting's surface. This was a chance to experiment with the limits of painting, rejecting the rules of illusionism set forth by the Renaissance, welcoming a chance for abstraction to communicate qualities of the human figure without the need for naturalism. Before long, Picasso and Braque experimented with more than just the design elements within the composition and began to introduce completely new materials and altered construction techniques as well. By 1912, they begin the phase that is known as synthetic cubism, 
where elements are synthesized or combined to form the image. This is a radical departure from traditional art because now we have elements of pop culture and mass production entering the physical space of fine art. Picasso himself did not print the newspaper included at the bottom left, nor the sheet music, nor did he print the patterns of the faux wood and the floral motif on the oil cloth. What we here usually call contact paper that was used to line walls or the inside of cabinets and drawers. Here, Picasso is suggesting that the artist need not be the sole creator at work. Instead, the artistic choices, especially the creation of tensions between planes of imagery, are the real products of creative impulse. Picasso is also inviting the modern world into his art, allowing viewers to recall the sound of the music present through both the sheet music and the form of the guitar and the noise of the city where this newspaper would have circulated. The wine glass is drawn in charcoal, still demonstrating the fragmented quality of the object. All of these angles and shapes do exist in the glass all at once, but humans do not have the ability to perceive all these angles and shapes at the same time. Thus, Picasso has liberated the object from the normal viewing constraints we place upon them all the while asserting the importance of the world outside of art and its permission to exist within the fine art space as well. Not long after Picasso and Brock had experimented with liberating objects from their normal visual constraints through cubism, other artists sought to use art as a form of liberation too. Begun towards the end of the First World War and continuing for at least two more decades after, the movement of surrealism offered artists an opportunity to mine their own internal experiences and make them the subject of artworks. They looked to find answers to life's difficult questions by bringing long suppressed impulses and events to the surface, using quite unorthodox methods to find meaning in the mundane, the silly, and even the nonsensical interactions between people, objects, and their surroundings. Influenced by the theories of the psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud, who exa examined that dreams and the unconscious mind help, held meanings that unlocked answers regarding human behavior and mental psychosis. The surrealist artists created strange juxtapositions in their works in an effort to find new meanings and replicate a dreamlike experience for themselves and viewers alike. One of the most famous artists of the Surrealist movement was the Spanish artist Salvador Dali, who created hyper-realistic paintings of exquisite detail only to include confusing elements and shocking implications. Here we see a depiction of the Catalonian coast in northeastern Spain, Dali's birthplace. But despite the accuracy and precision of the use of atmospheric perspective and naturalistic coloring of the coastline, there are elements within the composition that quickly alert the viewer to the fictional quality of the scene. In the center of the painting is a giant nose and half face with a closed eye, strewn oddly upon the ground with a melted clock laid on top. This nose is often a self-portrait of Dali, included as a reference to himself in these startling and nightmarish scenes. To the left, we have two more melting clocks, one hanging over a barren tree branch and the other sliding down the side of a platform. Another clock is overturned, face down, with ants covering the back, which faces us, so we can get a clear view of the deterioration and decomposition of time. There is nothing that suggests a realistic passage of time, but time is suggested by the darkening scene, suggesting the sun setting and the onset of night, the wilted clocks and the memory of a childhood home from the vantage point of an adult, living in a world where traditional political norms no longer exist and where social interactions are plagued by trauma. Not all surrealist art was nightmarish though. Many of the objects created by surrealist artists employ humor and plays on words. Oftentimes, artists would take ordinary objects and alter them in ways that made their original functions obsolete, forcing the viewer 
to invent a new purpose and meaning as a result. For instance, Merit Oppenheim's work Object, Luncheon in Fur, consists of a cup, saucer, and spoon completely covered in fur. Normally, utensils used to drink liquid, namely tea or coffee, they would be unappealing to use for that purpose in their altered state. As such, Oppenheim is not asking us to continue using these items as they had been used before. Rather, she is forcing us to experience a kind of physical, mental, and emotional reaction, likely revulsion, to such an unexpected tactile experience. These kinds of reactions awaken us, forcing us to reconcile with our long-held beliefs, expectations, preferences, and prejudices that often lie unexamined within our individual existences. Such rattling would not only be a productive human exercise, according to surrealists, but it would also be a chance for art to transcend its traditional roles of being something entertaining, pleasing, and reaffirming of a long-held status quo. One surrealist artist who used the medium of painting to mine her past personal trauma was Frida Kahlo. A Mexican artist married to a famous muralist and painter, Diego Rivera, Frida Kahlo struggled in her life to gain the same critical recognition for her work as her husband, but her body of work is a powerful testament to the ability of art to expose and to teach. This is in fact a double self-portrait called the Two Fridas, showing Kahlo's personal struggles with the tensions of her heritage and her love life. The Frida on our left is dressed in traditional European attire, referencing her German heritage from her father. The Frida's heart is exposed, though her proper right hand holds a surgical scissors that cut off the flow of blood, dripping clearly onto the bright white skirt. The Frida on our right, however, is dressed in traditional Mexican attire, referencing her Mexican heritage from her mother. We see her heart exposed again, with a thin red line attaching the two hearts together across both Fridas. In the Mexican Frida's proper left hand, she holds a small picture of Diego Rivera, whom she had recently divorced. Of course, these two versions of herself with hearts exposed and connected could not exist in real life. So the realism she brings to the scene is more reminiscent of a dreamlike state of mind. It is an arresting method of coming to terms with the internal turmoil she experienced in her life. Turmoil stemming from inherited features beyond her control and saddening events in her personal history. Though this painting may not have resolved any issues, it offered Kahlo an expressive format to recognize those issues and bring them to the fore instead of allowing them to remain buried inside. The movement of abstract expressionism in a way combines the features of both cubism and surrealism. Emerging in the United States in the 1940s and 1950s, this stylistic movement spoke to the new realities after World War II. For the first time, the United States was the dominant global superpower, as much of Europe was devastated during the war and the colonial possessions of many nations were being surrendered back to native peoples. As in the aftermath of World War I in the 1920s, the aftermath of World War II in the 1950s saw many individuals struggling to make sense of brutal violence they had witnessed, especially in the systematic extermination of Jewish populations in Europe at the hands of Nazi Germany and its leader, Adolf Hitler. How can we go back to valuing anything sensual or decorative after such human atrocities? How can we justify the political decisions that allowed such things to happen and the economic inequalities that fueled social tensions and political radicalism. Artists were just as active in these reflective conversations as others and sought to communicate their frustrations through art. Abstraction had offered artists in the 1900s and 1910s a way to analyze the world from different angles and to reimagine the role of the artist in that analytical process. Whereas surrealism had offered artists in the 1920s and 1930s 
ways to tap into deep-rooted anxieties, and invite new understandings of life and art. Now for artists in the United States in the 1940s and 1950s, a combination of abstraction and technique and emotional expression and content offered a chance to reflect on the universal desire to convey what it means to be human in that moment. Arguably the most famous artist of the abstract expressionist movement is the American painter Jackson Pollock. Pollock began his career painting surrealist images, dreamlike scenes and swirling patterns and colors. By the end of the 1940s though, he had developed his signature technique, the drip painting. Pollock approached painting in an unconventional way, rolling out long strips of unstretched, unprimed, raw canvas on the floor then dripping and throwing house paint onto the surface. Though many viewers thought his canvases were pure whims of fancy, he consistently claimed that they were not chaotic. Instead, each line and drip of colored paint reflected a deliberate movement and gesture on the part of the artist, and one can follow those movements layer by layer, understanding the expressive quality of artistic physical creation through prolonged looking almost able to trace for ourselves and replicate in our own bodies the movements of the artist. This invitation for the viewer to share in the physical movements of the artist was also an invitation to share in his emotional state, allowing a collective emotional expression and moment of catharsis. Just as the Cubists emphasized the flatness of their canvases and rejected the opportunity to make anything within it look illusionistic, Pollock takes that desire one step further, eliminating all sense of depth and perspective by removing any figurative reference at all. These colors and lines are the subject matter, not the mechanisms with which other subjects are suggested or shown. And the huge scale of these works, many of which were mural sized, makes the viewer feel immersed in this sea of color and line, either taking in the whole composition from afar or piecing it together by moving across the canvas while standing up close. A woman who supposedly taught many artists the poor technique, also known as staining, was Helen Frankenthaler, an abstract artist who poured paint directly onto unstretched, unprimed, raw canvas. Just as Pollock allowed the lines and colors to be the subject matter in his drip paintings, Frankenthaler allows the paint to exude a life of its own, letting it stain and spread across the canvas in unexpected and unrestrained ways, then following those movements of color with lines after the fact. This inverts the traditional method of illusionistic painting, where drawing and line create meaning through the delineation of forms, and color is added last to convey emotion, symbolism, and affect. Although Frankenthaler recalled real observations of nature for much of her subject matter, she did not let the physical realities of the natural world affect the behavior of the colors and lines. For example, this painting, Mountains and Sea, recalls Frankenthaler's visit to Nova Scotia and appears here as a vehicle for remembering the dramatic landscape of the region. Again, it may not be obviously figurative, but it is not intended to be chaotic. Unlike Pollock, who emphasized the gestural, expressive movement of the artist himself, Frankenthaler lets the materials be the star, encouraging viewers to see the natural tendencies of thinned paint on unprimed canvas, almost as if they had acted on their own. Other artists saw the life within the colors and forms of their canvases preferring to let those forms act of their own accord to communicate meaning to viewers. Mark Rothko painted enormous canvases covered in floating rectangles of color. Like the surrealist who found value in the experiment of juxtaposition, Rothko was intrigued by the interactions between these colorful forms that are juxtaposed in close encounters. Layers and layers of paint and a variety of colors exist on the canvas, 
giving the impression of depth and space beyond the surface, but a kind of depth that is perceivable but invisible at the same time. Rothko wanted viewers to see these works up close, their faces only a few inches away from the painted surface, in order to be immersed in the color. Confronted with the lack of figurative subject matter, viewers were left to contemplate the void and address their own emotional reactions without the distraction or assistance. What they saw within the void was a reflection upon their own psychological state, a reflection of their personal history, their social conditioning, their political ideologies, their religious beliefs, and more. Rothko, like Frankenthaler and Pollock, allowed the lines and colors to speak for themselves rather than serve in the representation of something else. This concludes our brief overview of Cubism, Surrealism, and Abstract Expressionism in the 20th century.